Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Eric Coleman with IIST and I will be the moderator for today's webinar, A Disciplined Agile Test Design Process by Dr. Meg DeHanna. We're excited you're able to join us today and set aside an hour to attend this webinar. This webinar is one in a series of free webinars to introduce the topics as well as the presenters of the upcoming SQTM conference in San Diego, California, September 13th through the 18th at the Sheraton San Diego Hotel and Marina. The conference focuses on advancing the test management and quality management professions by providing practical methods based on best practices. The ongoing theme of the conference, Practical, Proven, Feasible, keeps the focus on what works. To view the conference program and more information, visit www.qualitymanagementconference.com. Be sure to join us for the next webinar in the series, Mobile Testing, Manual and Automated, by Michael Uden, on April 30th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. To learn more about this and other webinars in the series, go to www.qualitymanagementconference.com. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing within 48 hours at www.qualitymanagementconference.com. I will now turn the webinar over to today's presenter, Dr. Maggie Hanna. Dr. Hanna? Thank you, Eric. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. Thanks so much for joining me today. Um, just would like to let you know that um, uh, today's webinar is really a condensation of a full day course on the topic um, uh, on um, tested design uh, for agile projects. The course is available online as well as it is actually scheduled as a live interactive course uh, to be offered uh, at the um, International Institute for Software Testing. Uh, but today I will <clears throat> try to share with you as much as possible of the methodology of how we can plan and design tests for agile projects. Uh, you all probably know very well, um, well here's a slide about myself if you think you'd like to know a bit about me if, in case you have not taken any yeah, any webinars or any courses from me in the past. Um, but um, I. As some of you might already know, I've been around for quite a bit. Uh, I've been, I've done everything possible in software, from being a, a developer to development lead to project manager. Then, uh, in the mid '80s, I switched to QA, where I uh, work at all possible jobs, from tester up to <coughs> QA lead, test manager, um, and I've done a lot of consulting for different companies around um, the the US and outside the US <coughs> um, yes I am the uh, CEO and founder of the International Institute for software testing as well as uh, the Romana software well enough for now here is my very simple agenda that I hope to cover with you today um, I'd like to spend just a few minutes it's to talk about uh, characterizing Agile so, with, so that we all know um, what to expect in an Agile project. If you, have, if you are already in an Agile project, then you know what you're living day to day. Um, um, then um, we'll talk about the goals of software testing in Agile projects, uh, which as we're going to see, it shouldn't be much different from the goals of testing in non-agile projects. Then I will show you the test, the test planning and the design process, uh, which has the four phases: the planning, design, sorry, the three phases: planning, design, and execution. I'm not going to be talking about bug reporting in this course, um, in this webinar, but in the full course, I speak about uh, bug reporting in agile projects as well. Um, I'd like also to share with you my model about risk analysis and risk management in Agile projects since we don't always have uh, time to do everything. Um, I'd like to share with you what I have been uh, practicing and teaching people how to uh, select the most critical scenarios and test it in an Agile project. All right. Um, let's move on here. Just very quick, uh, we, we, we want to talk about uh, what are the characteristics of an Agile project. If you have not been in an Agile project before, uh, then uh, you need to know that Agile, in general, is a, is a fast-paced project. Always, all Agile projects are fast-paced, meaning that we have to get things done quick, much, much quicker than non-Agile projects. Um, we build, uh, we put together uh, 
features or features uh, and deliver them possibly to the customer in two weeks. Um, however, in many, many agile projects, we don't actually deliver anything to the customer in two weeks, but rather we move things from the development environment to the test environment uh, in, you know, in two weeks. However, in some agile projects, what I consider aggressive agile projects, we actually move things from development to testing on a daily basis and maybe even several times during the day. Um, however, so the, the concept of the sprint being two weeks have been, have been modified a little bit in the very early days of Agile, um, according to extreme programming and Scrum, we were supposed to actually deliver something to our customer every two weeks. Well, many Agile coaches and product owners found this to be not very practical uh, and they started to, re to relax that um, and they take a number of features and they work on them uh, for two weeks, they call those two weeks or three weeks, depending on the Agile coach, uh, and they call this a sprint. And during the sprint, they implement a number of features. However, throughout the two weeks, uh, they could easily, the development team could easily move things to the test environment for testers to work on, on a, a daily basis, All right? Um, However, um, many other Agile projects do not uh, move things from um, from uh, um, from development to testing uh, right away. I can see a note here from Daryl saying, "I hate the two weeks sprint because it is tough to automate during that time." I agree with you 100%, Daryl. It is very tough to automate it during the two weeks. That's why. I've I always recommended that um, we let the QA team work, or, or I should say the testers within the Agile team, because I'm sure some people are going to criticize me when I say the QA team and the development team, because um, the assumption is in an Agile project, we don't have two teams, but we have one Agile team. So I'll say uh, we should let the testers or the QA people within the Agile team to go ahead and test manually every day during the sprint. However, there must be some uh, sort of uh, automation engineer uh, who is working uh, behind the scenes, taking the manual scripts, automating them for the purpose of regression testing. But certainly, uh, it, it's never been a practical, practical thing to do to automate during the sprint. All right. Um, the other in, the other characteristic of Agile, as we already know, it's incremental, meaning that um, we always slice and dice the features into smaller pieces. But you know what? Incremental is all common sense. We have learned about incremental delivery in the very old days in 1973, I believe, when Dr. Uh, Harlan Mills of IBM published his book on the clean room approach. If you read the book, you'll find that uh, Dr. Harlan Mills actually uh, proposed the idea of uh, doing things incrementally, not to uh, do a big chunk of functionality all at once. But certainly, Dr. Mills did not suggest the two weeks is, uh, sprint. Um, so um, it is great that the Agile framework uh, also use the concept of incremental. Now, highly iterative as well, meaning that we are not sure exactly about what the customer want. We may know, uh, we may know 80%, we may know 70%. Um, so we go and implement some prototypes, some uh, screens, and then we go back and uh, present them to the customer, and uh, we receive feedback from the customer, um, and based on that feedback, we modify the prototype, <coughs> and we go back to the customer, um, and uh, and uh, it goes on back and forth, back and forth, until the customer feels comfortable that this is what they want. And of course, after that, we should go back and build the product. So iterative is very good. Uh, again, <clears throat> uh, iterative development is not new to Agile. For those of you who read uh, the uh, James Martin of the UK back in the late 80s proposed the concept of RAD, uh, which stands for Rapid Application Development. And just iterative is another name for Rapid Application Development. So let me tell you this. <clears throat> if you worked in projects in the past that used RAD approach and you suffered from the lack of 
clear and precise requirements, uh, you'll have the same problems with iterative approaches. So as I always say, when we, t when we use iterative approach, uh, we always have list formal and list complete requirements, uh, and, and maybe we use user stories, and user stories are really, uh, <clears throat> people asked me last week when I was teaching the course uh, in Minneapolis, I said, I think I'm starting to believe that user stories as some people write them are just a fancy name for a poorly written requirement uh, or for a high level requirement. <clears throat> of course, certainly I do not want to general generalize because uh, uh, many agile projects um, uh, and uh, uh, they use the, the add something called the acceptance criteria. That's why in this webinar, uh, even if we're going to talk about user stories, I'm going to tell you that you have to use scenarios in connection with the user stories to um, overcome the the problem with the uh, with how brief they are. Certainly, in agile projects, we focus much more on talking as opposed to uh, write, documenting things because the agile manifesto said it very clear uh, that we value working systems over uh, comprehensive documentation. And not to say that we're not going to document anything, but rather we focus more on getting the application to work, which again, another thing you have to worry about, uh, because when, when there is a principle like that, um, um, then, then uh, many uh, people within the Agile projects, including the Agile coach and the product owner herself or himself, will, take, will use this as an excuse to uh, have to minimize documentation and focus on getting the system working and that's always a problem with maintenance. Um, I do not want to spend time here talking about the Agile Manifesto and how good or how bad it is. If you'd like to read my opinion uh, on the Agile Manifesto, go ahead and read my article on um, uh, a close look at the Agile Manifesto after 13 years. Uh, I this was published at the Software Development Magazine. It is available online. I think if you just uh, search my name uh, uh, and the Edge of Manifesto, you'll get across that article. I, I cannot remember the issue or the link or where it is exactly, uh, but just go ahead and search my name and next to the Edge of Manifesto, you should find the article. And you see the, the reaction from people and uh, how they reacted to my views about the Edge of Manifesto. All right, now we talk about when we test, when we test in an agile project, when we test in an agile project, what do we hope to achieve? What are what are our objectives? I'm I'm going to ask you to go ahead and use the questions panel to give me your thoughts. But I will also share because I, I may be able to share some of your thoughts with the audience. Uh, but here is what some people think that we need to do. Okay, we want to test as much of the requirements as possible. And by the way. Uh, we call this requirement coverage. Requirement coverage has to do with um, how deep do we, did we test the requirement? How deep did we test the requirement? Um, and the approach or the, the methodology I'm going to teach you today actually will help you achieve this goal. Uh, aside or in addition to this, I'd like to also make sure that you do not forget that there is another goal that's as important, if not even more important, than requirement coverage, and that is code coverage. Um, mainly meaning that we need to make sure to test as much of the code as possible. I understand that as QA people, we don't know much about the code, we don't read the code, uh, but, but uh, guess what? If the, when the release goes out or the sprint goes out, <coughs> and it runs on the um, production machines, and if there is one block of code or even one line of code that has not been tested, we don't know how it is going to behave in the field uh, or in production. Um, as a result, we need to do everything we can to make sure that we are testing as much as possible of the code even uh, we do not read the code. And one more time, the approach or the method I'm going to teach you today, <coughs> excuse me, uh, will help you achieve code coverage as well. <clears throat> so, for so many years, we've always had certain techniques to help us with requirement coverage and other set of techniques to help us with code, with code coverage. And the techniques that help with code coverage are normally uh, the code-based uh, testing techniques that we, we've taught developers all over, uh, over the years. But guess what? I have not seen developers using code-based 
uh, test design techniques. Need, need, I need to be very specific here because I remember one of the one of the editors in one of the magazines interviewed me three or four years ago and I said exactly that. Uh, developers do not use code-based test design techniques and those are things like uh, statement coverage, branch coverage, uh, um, uh, decision coverage and all that stuff. Uh, for some reason the uh, the editor, the editor did not comprehend what I said exactly, so he went and said, <coughs> um, Dr. Hanna says that developers do not do unit testing. There's a big difference between unit testing and code-based test design techniques. Uh, developers may, in fact, do unit testing, as they say they did, uh, but very, very, very few developers would, ever, would use uh, code-based uh, test design techniques. Well, aside from the requirement of coverage and, and, and the code coverage, and I meant to put these in front of you, uh, some people just simply say, I want to find as many bugs as possible. And that's by itself is also very good because, because um, um, finding a problem by itself is an important thing because that's what I would label as negative testing. Okay, negative testing. And the, even if we have even if we have um, done enough uh, good job in, uh, um, in, uh, in the quantity coverage and the code coverage, I suggested that you go and find ways to do more and more negative testing by which you find more bugs um, um, for, uh, in the software. Well, let me, let me click here to see if I got any input from people. Uh, uh, all right, I did not see any additional, well, let me, let me see here. No, I didn't see any additional input from uh, people to tell me what they're trying to achieve uh, when they test in an agile project. Okay, okay, so I think uh, the three things I said are good enough. Uh, okay, well, Daryl says, uh, assuming no uh, CI regression, um, um, tests, then as much manual regression, testing and verifying, okay, no, that has nothing to do with, um, with uh, my question regarding, uh, regarding the, uh, the, um, what the goals of Agile projects. All right, let's move on. Now, this is my Agile testing life cycle, okay? As you can see now, it, it has four components, four components like any other test design component or test testing life cycle com uh, out there, whether it's Agile or non-Agile. Uh, so we will do t Agile plan, Agile test planning, Agile test design, Agile test execution, and also Agile bug reporting. The only difference is, are two things, really. Uh, each one of those boxes, each one of those sub processes, if you want to call them, or tests, we're going to do, call, we're going to do them very, very differently from the way we do we do them in a non-agile project. Okay, um, so that's one difference. Each one of those uh, sub processes will be done very differently in an agile project. Um, the other difference is that if I were to put this a chart. For a non-agile project, you'll see there is a distance between these boxes. Uh, so you'll, you, would have, you would have seen the agile test planning here and the agile test design is moving quite a bit to the right and probably not starting until here. And with the same token, you'll see that the agile test execution is moved a little bit more to the right and so on. There is, so there is, more, there is less overlap between the, 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 these subtasks. And not only that. You can see now there is a feedback going from every task to every other task. That simply means that you could back and you could go backward and forward any way you want in an agile project, and you should be very flexible. And the process you you use much much must allow you to do this. So uh, so for example, you could be sitting here writing a bug report, and as you're writing a bug report, and of course, um, if if um, as I said. I'm not going to spend much time on writing bug reports in Agile projects uh, because I found this is much more than what I can cover in one hour. Uh, so if you were to listen to what I, what I say about uh, bug reporting in the full course, you'll find that sometimes you don't even write bug reports. You, you, you do something simple. You record, you, make, you create a recording and send it and attach it to the bug report. But, but 
if you are in the process of reporting a bug, regardless of how you're going to do this, you can see that you could possibly think of another test that you needed to perform while you are, so, so the reporting of the bug itself has given you an idea to explore and to go and execute another test so you could go back and execute another test or you might find yourself wanting to go back before you execute that additional test you might want to go and just do some design you create some test data you create some preconditions here and then you go back and execute the test or even in some cases you might find that the test you have started to think about late late here in the life cycle is much more than what you can just uh, go ahead and execute it or design it so you go all the way to the test planning to create some scenarios and then go down here to create some preconditions and post conditions then you go down here and execute it <clears throat> so as you can see uh, you can go from any sub process to another sub process anytime that's really the nature of the Agile project because we will never have time to do all the test planning upfront. So we're going to do as much as possible test planning. We're going to do as much as possible test design. We're going to move into test execution. We may discover that while we are executing tests, we need to go back and do some more design. By the way, this whole process is, I, I must give uh, credit for some people here like James Bach and, uh, and um, uh, Kim Kaner who have started this thoughts about exploratory testing. So yes, in, 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 uh, in Agile projects, we utilize a form of exploratory testing, although uh, in, my, in my way of, doing, of using exploratory testing is very different from what other people suggest. Uh, it, it has to be a little bit more what I call disciplined exploratory testing. And even when I do Agile, I always call it disciplined Agile. All right, this is a test design process. Let's now look at what we do in test planning. Uh, before I do that, let me peek into the questions. Um, <clears throat> of course, ideally I should leave questions till the end, but um, I see a question from David uh, Garcia. He says, how, how to test apps mobile based on the cloud? Uh, from usability, performance, and load uh, um, perspective using Agile. Well, I'm going to tell you something, David. Uh, uh, next Friday, that the 30, I believe, is that the 30? Uh, um, uh, we have a webinar on uh, testing uh, mobile applications, and our um, um, Michael Udenin is our expert in in, uh, in uh, testing mobile applications. Now, to be honest with you, when I was teaching this course in Minneapolis last week, I had one person sitting in the class that she was involved in testing mobile apps. And, and it, it is very difficult because, uh, because um, to, to be able to do what, what you mentioned here, performance and load and usability in an agile manner, it is, it is not that simple. But I, I'm going to ask you, please, David, to present this question to uh, Michael Uden. And, um, um, I heard uh, Eric saying on, it's on the 30th of April, uh, I'd like, maybe it's a Thursday, not a Friday. Please check the schedule uh, for our webinars. And, uh, and uh, he's doing it this week, I believe. It's not next week. It's this week. All right, um, another question uh, from Suman says, oh, that's about the objectives of software testing, but just it came a little bit late. Um, all right, okay. So, as I said, in test planning, in an Agile project, we'll do something very similar to what we do in test planning in other non-Agile projects. Um, but as I said, we're going to do it very differently. So we must always think about what we are going to test. I always called it what and what not. Um, this is simply the scope, the scope of your testing project. In, in a non-agile project, we, we always have to think about the scope on a much uh, larger scale. Um, in an agile project, we may, in, fa in fact, uh, finalize our scope um, in about half hour. Or, in fact, we might come to that point and try to do agile uh, test planning and find out that the scope 
in terms of what features we'll be testing uh, have already been determined for us by the agile coach or the product owner because he or she has already selected a set of user stories that we're going to be testing so yes in this first bullet I'm simply say saying step one of planning is to know what we are going to be testing in terms of features requirements or user stories I'm generalizing here because certainly not every agile project uses uh, user stories some uses requirements some use uh, just the word features. So whatever it is, we need to have the what I call the feature list. Now, also in addition to that, we need to understand the, dip if the dependencies, if any, between the different features. Because obviously there are certain things that, that must be tested before other things, and, 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 and certain things can only be tested after other things. There are certain other features or user series that must be tested together, and so on. So we need to understand that. Very simple thing. Again, uh, you finalize this in no more than 10, 15 minutes. Now, the next bullet is to what extent we're going to be testing each feature. I'm talking about the depth, the depth to which, to, to which we test each, each feature or user story or requirement. This, this, this simply means that we need to determine the scenarios we will be testing within each feature or within user stories. Absolutely. Now, of course, some people will say, of course we are going to test everything to the greatest extent. Well, um, you're not going to be able to do this in an Agile project all the time. So that's why I always suggest that you take the feature or the user story or the requirement and start to determining all the scenarios that are there. And then I'm going to show you how to run, through my, to run those scenarios through my uh, risk-based model by which you can select those scenarios that you said you're going to be testing. Now, also keep in mind, some of those scenarios are out of the scope of the feature or the user story. So that's why uh, an important part of developing those scenarios is to determine with the cons uh, in consultation with the product owner whether those scenarios are actually part of the user stories or not. So you take a user story, you come up with uh, 45 scenarios for that user story, you go back and speak with the product owner, you might find out that probably 10 or 15 of those are outside the scope. It was a good idea that you thought about them, good idea that you, you explored them, but you'll find that the product owner saying, no, no, that's outside the scope, so let's keep them aside. And it becomes up to uh, the product owner at this point to go and create additional user stories to be considered in future releases or future sprints. Now, uh, once you remove all the things that are outside the scope of the feature or the user story, then you come further, as we're going to see, and apply the risk-based model. And the risk-based model simply saying, okay, out of those ones that we thought are within the scope, which ones are we really going to test? And I'll show you this in a little bit. But after you apply the risk-based model, then you, in, then you end up by a set of scenarios that really represent, in my opinion, represent the level of requirement coverage that we are willing to do. We are not going to do 100% requirement coverage. There is no way on earth in any Agile project that you would do that. Yes, you will have some scenarios that you know are part of the feature or the user story, but you will not test them. But you will only decide this based on the risk model. Now, once you know what scenarios you're going to be actually testing, then you start to think about environments that we're going to be testing on. Sometimes people say, well, you've got to think about this first. I say no, because if I think about the environment in which we're going to test, then I'm, I might be considering all scenarios. I want to first narrow down the scenarios, then think about the environment. The environment here has to do with what hardware we're going to be using, what software we're going to be using, what other systems we're going to be using, and those are all determined by which scenarios I'm going to test. So it doesn't really make sense to, to, think, about, to think about environments up front before I narrow down my scenarios. Now keep in mind, all this test planning stuff happens in about no more than one hour. Don't get me wrong, this is not a week of work here. We don't do that. We don't do this in Agile projects. So you decide on which ones. So, so it's just when you take one feature at a time and you start building the scenarios, that's going to take time. Now, 
Absolutely, absolutely. It is very critical on the planning phase of an agile project to determine for each scenario how do we expect the system to handle that. Typically, typically in a non-agile project, we don't think about this until very late when we start our test design and we, we start writing our test cases. In agile projects, it will be that, that, that would be too late. I do, do not want to wait until I write test cases and, and write my, the expected results of my test cases. You know why? Because in fact, I might not even write test cases. I, I know this comes as a surprise to some of you. Yes, it is true. In some Agile projects, for certain scenarios, I may not even write test cases. Why? Because I don't have the time to write the test cases. But I do have my scenarios. And I do have what to expect the system to do and how do I expect the system to handle each scenario. So I'll do what I'm going to show you, which is simply executing the scenarios without writing test cases. Remember, this is an Agile methodology that, that must utilize the spirit of Agile in the sense that it must be very flexible. It must be very flexible. And the flexibility here is saying that I may write automated scripts, I may not write automated scripts, I may write manual or not, I may not even write scripts at all, I may just write the test cases without the scripts, or I may not even write the test cases, I, but I must always have, at minimal, I must always have the scenarios. All right, uh, let me see if there's any question here. I have a question here, uh, says, shouldn't test cases be created or used uh, alongside the user stories? Uh, just just to hold on for me on that. I think you need to see the whole process, uh, uh, Deanna. You need to see the whole process to see where test cases fit um, with respect to uh, user stories. Uh, and as I said, I just said that uh, uh, we may not even we may not even uh, write test cases, uh, but we're we're still going to test. Uh, don't be surprised and don't, don't, don't think that how are we going to test without test cases. We'll see in a little bit. Okay, that's my process. That's, I, 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 know, I know what I have been uh, doing, what I have been teaching my testers to do, and it works great. So, no, um, at, at, we have, we're going to have user stories but may not have test cases. All right, any question about planning? Uh, now, here's the process. Diana, I wish I waited a bit to answer your question here because that's a process. All right. Um, uh, in the middle of this chart, you see this dashed line. The line separates uh, agile test planning from agile test design at the bottom here. Now, at the top, you can easily see two uh, shades of colors. I use the, the right-hand side, the darker shade, to um, reflect or to represent a more formal process. The less formal process is on the left and the center when we use only user stories or user interface. Now, uh, yes, yes, it is true that I am considering that when we use user stories, we are using a very informal form of agile requirements and agile testing. Because user stories are very brief, are high level. Just for those of you who have not seen a user story before, a, a user story would look like this. Uh, as a customer of IIST, I'd like to be able to register for a free webinar online. That's it. That's a high-level user story. Uh, some people say, I, I might want to break this down to more user stories. I say, break down what? We don't even know. The user story did not not tell me, I mean the way it is stated, did not tell me what's involved in, in registering for a free webinar. If I've known that as part of registering for a free webinar, um, I receive, for example, a, a confirmation from IST, then probably I would have recommended that we write another user story that, that says, uh, as a customer, I'd like to receive a confirmation uh, for my registration, for example. But other than that, you don't know anything. 
for example, when we when we sign up, when you sign up for a free webinar, the system does something behind the scenes that you don't even know as a customer. All right, and the, the thing that happens behind the scene is um, is our web server uses um, uh, uses a web service to communicate with the go to webinar uh, uh, with the go to webinar platform to actually put you there i mean you register on our website and you get confirmation from our website but what you don't know is that there is a web service running in the background to register you uh, on the go to webinar platform and then you receive another confirmation from go to web webinar uh, with the link to join the webinar. Now, here's an interesting thing. If I were to use user stories in my Agile project, guess what? I don't think I'm going to write this in the user story because there is no user involved here. There is a system to system, and I always tell people this. I said, keep in mind, keep in mind, if, if we keep talking about user stories as the user's experience, well, you as a user, experience, as a user do not even know about what's happening behind the scenes. So uh, w for all reasons, I don't think... Uh, user stories really add anything at all to what we have known for years as requirements. All right, it is true that user stories allow us to write things in a, in a much more brief manner, much short, and, and, but guess what? Short and the brief means that they don't have the details. So I don't know how to react to this. That's why whenever you have a user story, I'd like always to combine it with some user interface. I can understand much more about the user story if I have the user interface, the screens, and so on. Now, in a little bit more formal situations in an Agile project, you may actually have requirements. And I've seen a lot of Agile projects uh, continuing to use the concept of requirements uh, uh, as opposed to user stories. Or in, a, in a even much more formal projects, you may use use cases. Use cases, I don't play, by the way, uh, are not to be confused with user stories. Use cases are much more elaborate, much more details than even requirements. User stories have scenarios inside them. We call them use case scenarios. For each scenario in a user in a use case, um, it has preconditions, it has post conditions, it has the steps to be executed. So let me tell you this: if your project decides to use uh, use cases, uh, you are in a much better shape. You're far ahead uh, uh, of the curve, and you have much more details to work with. Now, it is my um, idea and my experience that whether you're using user stories or user interface or requirements, you must always have a, a forum of discussion and the questions and the answers to be asked. So you take anything you have and you keep and ask lots of questions. And not only that, I'm also always recommending that those answers and the questions to those answers must always be documented somewhere. Now, of course, once I say documentation, you know, the agile uh, people will say, no, we cannot, we don't have time to document anything. Let me tell you this, uh, just briefly, because we don't have time to talk about it in details. The agile framework recommends a lot of talking over documenting. The Agile framework believes in face-to-face -face interactions. In fact, one of the very rough, hard points that I objected to in the Agile Manifesto, and you can read this in my article, uh, when the Agile Manifesto said this, which, which in my opinion is almost ridiculous to say, it said, the most effective and most efficient way to build quality systems is through face-to-face -face communication. Again, the most effective and most efficient way to build quality systems is through face-to-face -face communication. This is exactly the wrong thing. This is exactly what we've been telling people, don't you do it. Now, face-to-face -face communication is good when you and the eyes stand talk, but, but you know, when you and the I start to making important decisions in the hallways and in the cafeteria, uh, uh, this is this is not this is not face to face. If we meet, that's fine. But 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 we meet to talk. But everything has to be documented because, in fact, that principle uh, combined with the principle of we we value working the systems over uh, comprehensive documentation, it causes agile project. I have a, a a lady in my class this week and this week last week. And she said, critically, she does not even write bug reports. 
If she does, she find problem. She walks to the developer to explain to them the problem. Although you know she can do this to to speed things up, but I'm I'm very concerned about this because I don't know what we have over time. We don't have bug reports. We didn't document bug reports. All what we have is what we had problems. We solved them. Now the system works. I don't think that's healthy in my opinion. Okay, so. We ask questions, we answer, we document to those answers, and find a way to document them. If you are actually in a meeting to ask, to ask those questions, then find a way to document those. If you are not in a meeting, like, like my team, because my team is scattered all over the world, I cannot hold the meeting, so I do it all in the internet. And I use actually the Romana ALM product to, it's R-O-M-M-A-N-A, R-O-M-M-A-N-A, -A, Romana. Uh, that that product I architected myself to include that feature, and be able to for to allow people to collaborate and ask questions, and the questions and answers are are documented. All right, based on those questions and answers, we go and build the scenarios. All right, I don't believe I have a definition for for a scenario here for you. No, I don't. But let me just I mean, if you have attended my courses or my webinars before, you know the concept of scenario. It's just simply a one line thing, one sentence that describes a situation or a condition that could possibly happen. There is no way around it. And no one comes and say, now you are adding an additional layer in which we add scenarios. In fact, I'm not adding only one layer. I'm going to add two layers. And that is developing scenarios and validating, validating scenarios. And if Agile coaches do not agree to that, then they don't know how to run a good Agile project. Why? Because scenarios are actually what is going to happen in, in production. And if I do not write code and I do not test the, to those scenarios, then, pre, then actually I do not know what I'm doing. And I'm just shooting in the dark. I am doing anything that has nothing to do with production. Scenarios reflect what will happen in production. Please understand that. And you must list those. And not only that, for each scenario, you're going to list whether this scenario is in a scope or out of scope. Because as I said earlier, some scenarios will be outside the scope. I must also list whether this scenario is a positive or negative, which is a very critical thing. I mean, when I when I teach this course to, to, to in my in my in my public training and online training, people you, you know people are pleased to see that they are being forced to think in negative upfront. So you have to think you have to know which scenarios are positive, which scenarios are negative, and there, are, there is a definition of each one of them. You also have to determine whether this scenario actually is explicitly stated in the requirement or not. And again, those of you who have taken my three-day course on best practices and software test planning and the design have ex experienced that. The truth is, <clears throat> when we take a user story or, or a even a requirement that has much more details, and they start building scenarios, and they start determining for each scenario whether it is in, in actually in the requirement or not, <clears throat> Guess what we typically find? We find much, much more scenarios that are not explicitly stated in the requirement. Some, some of the numbers I recall from my uh, uh, classroom exercises, uh, a team will come up with, say, 45 scenarios. And I, when, when I look at the number, it says how many of those scenarios are actually explicitly stated in the requirement or the user stories. Uh, I think last week one of the teams said they had about 35 scenarios, and only five of them are explicitly stated in the user story, and the other 30 are not. However, those 30 have been determined to be in the scope of the user story. So what are we doing? If we take, if we take that user story and try to test based on that without going through the scenarios, then we're going to be testing only five things. By going through this very simple exercise to come up with scenarios, we came up with additional 30 scenarios to test. That is what I consider requirement coverage. Now, it is true that you may, you may decide not to test all 35 scenarios. But guess what? Your developers already know about those scenarios. You have developed those scenarios. You have validated them with your, <clears throat> with your uh, product owner and your developers. And now your developers are going to write the code for those scenarios. 
So this is now the test planning. The outcome of the test planning is either scenarios that are coming from user stories or user interface or requirements, or you have actually use case scenarios that are coming from, from use cases. Then we move down to the test design. I believe the test design uh, is very, coming very soon here, but before I do that, let me elaborate on test planning a little bit. So where do we start to come up with our feature list? Or because the first thing in our test planning, we need to understand uh, what features are we are we testing and what dependencies between them. This is just the you know the slide we were talking about. This one here. Okay, sorry, this one here. So how where do we start to, in order to achieve this? Well, very simple. If you have user interface available to you, you can start with that. And and please, when you have user interface, do not try to test the user interface. Please try to use the user interface to extract the features or the requirements or the user story. Because you look at one screen, which I, you know, when I give you one screen in my classes, you'll be able to ex extract uh, maybe five to ten different user stories. And, and if you're supposed to test that screen, then those are the ten user stories you're supposed to test. You need to narrow down. You need to bring your test, your scope of testing to what stories or what requirements are uh, you're, you're supposed to test. If you've given a list of user stories, start with that. You need to create your own list. You need to 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 go to have to say here is what I think we're going to be testing in this release. Very interesting. When I did this exercise last last week. I had two ladies in the classroom who are very involved in Agile projects, and they never got to think of this one. Why? Because, as I said, in some Agile projects, the decision has already been made for you. The Agile coach or the product owner has already decided what user stories. So I gave them the screen, and I said, here is a user interface available to you. Please find out for me what user stories we need to test. And they kept coming back to me asking, says, okay, what, what are we supposed to test? I said, that screen. They said, what's, what's in the screen that we're supposed to test? I, I said, that's what you're supposed to tell me. So I am, I am trying to teach you as a test professional how to extract the user stories or requirements from the user interface. Because it is not always that you're going to have an agile coach or a product owner who's going to tell you, here are the user stories. That would be the easy part if you're, to if you're being told what to test. Okay? You you're not always being told what to test. You, in many, many cases, you have to discover for yourself what you're supposed to test. And as I say here, you know, you go and validate this with the product owner. He says, based on this, here's what I think we're supposed to test. Is this, is this the scope, or am I missing something, or am I adding something beyond the scope? That's what you have to do. Okay. As I said earlier, once you have the feature list, you create the scenarios, and, and I'll show you how to do the risk model based on impact of failure, frequency, and the probability of failure, failure like that. So you start listing your scenarios like that. And there are three factors here. The impact of failure is simply saying, what would happen, what would happen if I were not to test that scenario and it were to go in, the, in production and it were to fail there? What is the impact, high, medium, or low? And keep it that simple. The frequency simply saying, how often do we think this scenario is going to happen? If it is the kind of scenario that someone is going to say, well, I'm not sure exactly if, if anyone is going to do this, then what? Then that's a low frequency. If this is a scenario where someone is going to say, well, I, I think that happened quite a bit, probably a couple times a day, well, that's high then. And anything in between is medium. Now, the third one is what I consider most very critical, and that's what is the likelihood for this scenario to fail? Somewhat, some people say, well, I don't know. If I test it, I can tell you if it's going to fail or not. I said, no. We need to decide if we should test it or not. And, and sometimes we, as QA people and testing people, we don't have enough knowledge to use in order to determine probability of failure. 
But let me tell you something, or at least the two guidelines that are going to help you. Remember when I said, when we build the scenarios, we're going to decide for each scenario whether it is actually explicitly stated in the requirement or not. And I, I just gave you the example of the team from last week that said 35 scenarios, five of them were explicitly stated in the requirement, and the other 30 were not. I think it does not require a genius to figure out that the 30 scenarios that are not explicitly stated in the requirements have the highest probability of failure. Why? Because if they're not in the requirement or the user story, then most likely the developers did not know anything about them. So they're not writing code to handle. That's why I say all scenarios that are not explicitly stated in the requirement or the user story, please go ahead and give them high prob probability of failure immediately. The same is true about all the negative scenarios. Why? Because with all, all due respect to our uh, wonderful developers, if they ever do any level of testing or any type of testing, they only do positive testing. Unless you have developers, an, an exceptional developer, who do negative testing. And I'm, I'm willing to believe that there are some of those out there. But the majority, if not all developers, if they perform a testing, they only perform a positive testing. Then again, it does take a genius to find that, to say, well, then I need, then I'm assuming that the negative scenarios have not been tested by developers. So I'm going to give them higher probability of failure. With these two, you, you know, with these two guides, you determine the probability of failure. Now, you can see now I calculated a number here, and that number is simply an average of the three, considering high to be three, low to be one, median to be two. So three plus one plus two, that's six, divided by three, it is 2.0. Down here, 1 plus 2 plus 1, that's 4, divided by 3 is 1.33. I use this number here as my testing priority. This is simply telling me how critical it is to test that scenario. If you do this, by the way, the, the Romana ALM product that I architected for this purpose and many other purposes does this exactly for you. And it gives you this report, and it sorts the report for, for the report for you uh, based on on that number. But guess what? I don't think you want to buy Romana in order just to do this, unless you really want to do everything else that Romana does. So, just go ahead and do this in Excel spreadsheet, okay? And you sort the Excel spreadsheet on the testing priority, and now you bring up all the higher pri priorities at the top, and then you can decide. You may say, let me take everything that's 2.0 and above. So now you're taking, you're taking uh, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 out of the 9 scenarios. You may think that's good enough. Go ahead. If you think that's too much or too many scenarios, say I'm going to take the 1.66 and above. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm going to take only the, the 2.3 and above. Well, if you take the 2.3 and above, you only have one. I don't think that makes sense. You see that? I'm sorry, you have two. This and this. Number six and number nine. So I think you would go for 2.0 and above. If you have more time than that, you can go down to, say, 1.66 and above. So you, you also grab this one here, so it becomes a seven. And the only two you're leaving out is the, the, this one here, the 1.33, and this one here. But you can decide how many scenarios you are going to test based on the time you have. Now, I got only uh, four minutes left, but I, I think I spoke about most of the test design as I'm going. But let me touch on it very quick here, okay? because that's the same chart we've been talking about here. So in test design, what do we do? You take one scenario at a time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And you do, you start thinking about what input am I going to use? And the most important, you, you, you need to think about valid and invalid input because that's, that is how you do positive and negative testing. You also think about what they call preconditions. The preconditions are all the things you must have prepared and must be true before you run the tests. Okay, please 
understand that preconditions are slightly different from prerequisites or from the setup. They are much, much broader than the setup steps. So if I am canceling an order and refunding the money, then I have to say preconditions are things like, does the order exist or not? Um, has the order been shipped or not? Is this a refundable order or not? As you can see, those things are not necessarily the setup. But these are the things you need to think about before you run a test. Now, what should you expect? Someone says, is this any different from uh, what we did in test planning? Remember, I'm going to take you back here quick. Uh, how do we expect the system to handle each scenario? Remember, this was an expected results on the scenario level. Now, here, you're talking about expected results on each test case. Because you might, you're going to take one scenario and write multiple test cases. Besides, what to expect here is a, in a much lower level than what we said in the scenario level. I wish we had the time to show you some examples, but this happens in the full course. Uh, now, most importantly, where do I look for the things I expect? How do I find it? I'm supposed to verify that, that I got what I expected or not. So, so where do you look for that? Which database tab tables and so on? Now, here is the process again. Very quick now, because I, want ne I need to answer the question for uh, uh, Diana, who, who said uh, test cases and, use, and user stories. Now, you take the scenarios here, and you go down. You have, you have two options here, as you wish. You could go here from the scenarios, uh, and you go formal and write actually formal test cases. And those formal test cases, um, I don't have an example for you in this presentation because I don't have time. Because the, but they are the formal test cases we write typically in a non-agile projects. Those, those, those test cases that have input, they have preconditions, they have output, they have post conditions. And I teach those in my um, non-agile courses anyway. Or I find that, that I don't have time, so I go and do exploratory tests. Now, exploratory tests are documented in a very different way from formal tests. They only have the test title, or the test case title, and the description, and the expected results. That's it. Very brief. So that you can, you can document a hundred of those in one hour. Or you do a combination, by the way. Some scenarios are going to be tested formally. Some scenarios will, not, will be tested exploratory. Now, whether you do formal test cases or exploratory test cases, you're encouraged to go and form a test design. Uh, sorry, test sets. A test set is a group of test cases that will, will be executed together. For each one of the test sets, you could go either manual script, you can write manual scripts, and you could do, or you could do automated scripts. Or you could do manual scripts, and after that, the test automation engineer will do the um, we'll write the automated scripts. Now, here is the components of an exploratory test case, because I'm sure you have not seen it before. It has test case number, it has a test case title. And these are the only two things that are required. You could also provide description, you could provide expected results and actual results if you have to. But this is how I document my exploratory tests. All right, uh, for the agile test execution, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that if we don't have time, you could take the scenario as is and execute it. Meaning what? The scenario has a scenario title. It has description. It has an expected behavior. You need to convert this in the, into an exploratory test. And you can see there's no much difference between a scenario and exploratory test. So, so I will look at the scenario and say, let me test that. And based on the description, I run the scenario without having the scripts or anything. All right. Uh, let me now very quick, because I'm beyond my time now, so let me see if I have any questions there. Uh, question from uh, Joshua says, uh, would you recommend a test team have three uh, their own sprint that lags a developer sprint? No, no. An agile coach, coach would not like that. Uh, so the development team have a sprint. You cannot have your own sprint. Okay, now, now, having said that, I have seen it over and over again that the test team will be, will be testing the previous sprint that developers have finished, if that's what you mean. So developers finished the sprint two weeks ago, and we did not test during that time. They finished the sprint two weeks ago. 
This week we are testing the sprint they finished two weeks ago. And and they are working on the next sprint. If this is what you mean, yes, I would recommend you that. It's not bad at all because you cannot possibly catch up if that's the question. Uh, Diana says, uh, test sets are used when regression testing is being done. No, test sets are done in general uh, because when I write my test scripts, uh, I do not want to write a test script for every single test case that I'm writing. I want to cluster or group test cases together into, like, I take 15 test cases, for example, that has to do with uh, canceling an order. And I put those together as one test set, and I write one script. And I write one script for those 15 test cases. Uh, again, my apology for going beyond my time. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Hanna, for your time today, and thank you to everyone for joining us for today's webinar sponsored by IIST, the leaders in education-based certifications and training. For more information on how IIST can help you or your organization, please visit www.iist.org. You can follow IIST on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube to find out more about IIST news, events, and promotions. Thank you all again for joining us today, and have a great day.